Welcome back to this week's episode of the Star Wars Universe Podcast. Today we are talking about The Mandalorian, Season 1, Chapter 5, The Gunslinger. Today we're seeing what happens when a, you take along a not terribly experienced bounty hunter on a contract. Today we're learning about the maternal instincts of people around the child. And today we are going back to Tatooine. All that and more after this ad we have no control over. Folks, I'm Matthew, one of your hosts. I'm joined, as always, on a Mandalorian day by Jeff. Jeff, how are we doing today? Oh man, I'm doing fantastic. Good yeah. to talk about the Mandalorian again. Mandalorian Ooh. day is always a fun day. It is a good day because you know we we're a little cooped up right now with, uh, <laughs> with COVID nineteen. So you know this gives me something to look forward to. Yeah, you have you, it's uh, you and your partner and the kids all kind of uh, staying at home and learning to love each other. Mm, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, th- this is one actually I think you'll enjoy. Um, just this morning over to my other podcast, uh, the Superhero FX podcast, um, I recorded an episode specifically on um, uh, what media you choose as a parent. Um, and, and we did that especially because I think for right now, you know, a lot of parents are probably turning to a lot more screen time for very understandable reasons with, you know, the kids now home 24 hours a day. Um and it, it led to a lot of really good conversations that I'm going to be curious about to hear your thoughts on. And, and a lot of it was about, you know, how do you introduce something like Star Wars to kids where, you know, some of this might be at a little slower pace than uh, what kids of today are used to. So um, as well as just all the decisions about, you know, things with the MCU and like what is or isn't appropriate for what age levels and violence and, and sexuality and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was it was it was a really fun conversation that it, it it certainly gave me a whole much more respect for parents like you who are you know, love this kind of media and always trying to decide like when and how do you show it to your kids? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to, uh, to track down. Cause you want to, there's, there's several factors to it. You want to, you want to control what goes to them and you want to, you know, make sure that they're ready for what's coming at them. But then again, you don't want to take all the time in the world to, to, kind of pre-screen everything and especially if it's something that's in the theater you don't want to go to the theater multiple times with multiple people like that gets expensive yeah of course several times over just to make sure (laughs) that it that it's okay for them when like i'm good just going once because you know i can i you know i'm an adult and can most of the time separate what's on the screen from like real life and you know maybe take a lesson or two from it but also you know, I, I'm okay with some of the things that that come up in like the Logan movie. Yeah, you know. But are you saying? But Logan's got kids in it. Wouldn't that be great for kids? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're funny, sir. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk today about a, another show that has a kid in it. But I'm guessing it's probably not too high on your let's show to young kids list. Uh, the Mandalorian. Um, yeah. <laughs> today we're talking about Chapter Five, The Gunslinger. And um, for those who are listening along, but uh. It's been a little while since you saw it. Let me just give you the quick episode recap. The Mandalorian defeats a bounty hunter in a dogfight. He lands his damaged ship at a nearby repair dock run by mechanic Peli Mato in Moss Eisley on Tatooine. And yes, that is that Moss Eisley on that Tatooine. He seeks work in a cantina to pay for the repairs, meeting aspiring bounty hunter Toro Calican, who is tracking elite mercenary and assassin Fennec Shand. Calican needs to catch Shan to join the guild, and the Mandalorian agrees to help when Calican offers to let him keep the money. They capture Shan in the desert, but she destroys one of their speeder bikes. The Mandalorian goes to get a dewback uh, to, uh, they passed for transportation, a dewback being one of the large animals they use for transportation on this planet. While Calican watches Shan, she tells him that the Mandalorian betrayed the guild, making the bounty on him and the child worth more than hers. Shan offers to help Calican capture the Mandalorian if he sets her free, but he shoots her instead and rides the remaining speeder bike to the repair dock, taking Moto and the child hostage. The Mandalorian arrives, uses a flare to disorient Calican, and kills him. He takes Calican's money to pay Moto for the repairs, thanking her before leaving Tatooine. Out in the distance, a mysterious figure approaches Shan's body. So yeah, we had a, a lot going on here. Um, and and I, I often I start by just saying, kind of, what do you think? But I, I want to jump in with just one quick thought on that... Um, the dog fight with the other ship. Um, you know, mostly so far, this has been a on the planet story and it was kind of fun to see a little bit of space combat. Um, but here's the thing. I love the movie top gun and in the movie top gun, our hero Maverick uses a trick 
where all of a sudden he slams on the brakes, the other ship go, the other plane goes by, and he yep. blows it up. Yep. This is at least the seventh movie or TV show I've seen use that exact same trick. It's been yeah, man. hundreds of years since Top Gun. Hasn't someone learned that it's a bad idea? Hundreds <laughs> like, of years. <laughs> or, or hundred, who Timelines are, are funny things. But yeah, like, I, did, did you have that same connection when you saw that moment? No, nah, man, this obviously, this is in a galaxy far away a long time ago. <laughs> so this happened first and Maverick learned that from him. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. This, I, is, this is stories passed down, you know, through the stars, through the ages. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the timeline in the fictional world, I just, I'm getting, there's so many other cool things that a pilot could do to win a space combat. I'd kind of like writers to move away from that particular trick. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I know they do it in Independence Day. Sorry, go ahead. Especially in space when you've got, you know, the in in spacecraft, there are thrusters so that you could you could get any angle at all that you wanted to have happen. And you can do almost anything like it's it's a bad idea in uh, atmospheric dogfighting, so to speak, uh, to go into a flat spin, as we saw in Top Gun. Right. It, It probably would have been pretty cool to see something similar to that happen you know because in space you can recover from it especially when there's nothing around yeah you can recover from it pretty (laughs) pretty easily but like have him turn into like a death flower of lasers just going out everywhere and he's just spinning and the lasers are going crazy you know that that could be neat maybe Mm -hmm. you know just anything else other than this whole i'm gonna hit the brakes and he'll fly right by like Come on, man. Yeah, it's it's a little silly, but but anyway, it, it, it's a fun scene and it sets us up well. Um, what what's kind of your overall take on this episode? You know, it's it's another episode that's uh, episode in a bottle. You know, yeah, we've got we've got um, the kid and the bounty like those those things stick out because they're you know the they're the 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 nagging thing and you know in the back of our our hero's mind of like I've got to take care of this bounty probably maybe. Uh, or we can keep running. You know, it's the reason he's somewhere else. But, you know, that's the only thing that really carried over from the rest of the series. And this, you know, it just it was the dropper to start the environment or to, you know, be a catalyst, so to speak, in this in the bottle of this environment. So he's going to fly out of here and into another bottle. And in, in the next episode, I'm, be- I'm betting. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, that that seems pretty right. I, 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 I've commented before that I like day in the life episodes and I'm really I'll say this. I, I definitely enjoyed this episode the first time I saw it. The second time I was like, okay. Because I don't feel like it added much to... This doesn't add anything really to the overall story. It reminds us that the bounty hunters are still, you know, hunting him. It reminds us that other things are happening. But mostly I look back and I saw, like, kind of a lot of wasted opportunities. Um, it, If nothing else... To me, if you tell me you're going to Tatooine a couple of years after the events of Return of the Jedi, I'm now really interested. I'm now like, oh, yeah, Tatooine was completely run by the Huts. Jabba is now dead. What's happening on this planet? I'm really curious. Um, right. Tatooine. Right. There's, there's things that can be talked about. Tatooine is the home of the birthplace of the great war hero, Luke Skywalker. Like, maybe there's tourists flocking to his home, you know? Maybe it's become a shrine, or maybe it's become someone making a lot of money, selling, like, you know, here's the, 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 the you know, place where uh, Luke shot womp rats. Go pay 20 bucks to, to shoot a womp rat yourself, you know? Like, <laughs> g- give me mysticism or give me capitalism. Like, someone's going to be profiting off of Luke Skywalker's birthplace. And I... I you know, it is the same Mos Eisley Cantina, as far as I can tell. And, you know, there's someone new in charge. There's now a droid instead of the guy behind the bar. But otherwise, it just felt like there was no... They didn't take the time to say, okay, let, let's show you what Tatooine is like after Jabba is dead. And so it just kind of made me wonder, like, why did we go there in the first place? Yeah, I mean, the we've been saying in, in this series that it would be so great to you know see what the the people are doing right in right. in the the days after the years after the war and and kind of get a feel for the the guy on the ground the little man so to speak but they had such an opportunity with this one going back to the place where we you know like we've seen these things before we know 
like we know the the before photo on this one and we're getting you know you're giving us an after photo and you like you didn't show us anything really like Mm -hmm. it's out of focus so to speak like there could have been so many things shown and so many ways that they could have gone with this and it it feels like they just kind of i don't know it's like they were scared of going into too much detail on like what has happened in in the places where luke was and you know anything like that it was just it's like they purposely avoided it because they were probably going to piss somebody off right and i'm that you know i worked i worked that out as i was talking yeah. just now like oh it was that they probably were going to piss somebody off and they just avoided it yeah that's true i guess that maybe one of the things that like a lot of the eu canon you know dove pretty deeply into before they kind of erased all of that um it just, it just, it just, and I, I guess like they are going for this desert western theme, and they've already established Tatooine as a desert western kind of a planet. Um, it just definitely left me kind of disappointed. Um, yeah. But other things, um, there was a bunch I really liked about this episode. Um, <clears throat> I really liked the character, the mechanic. Um, just for one thing, because we, we, as we've commented, we've not seen that many um, women characters until the last episode. Um, and I, I liked that she was a she was a complex character, especially in that, you know, when she first sees the child, like we've already got, gotten introduced to her as as being someone who really cares about making a buck and cares about you know trying to make the most out of the situation. And when you meet the child, it seems like for a moment like she's going to go one of two directions: either a, this maternal instinct is going to kick in and she's just going to go into caretaker mode, or b. She's going to stay that same, like, let me get as much money out of it as I can. And (laughs) what I saw and what I believed watching her was she genuinely cares about this child. She's definitely enjoying babysitting this child and like, oh, yeah, this child is really cute. And I'm kind of actually worried about this child. But also I'm going to charge the Mandalorian even more that I have to now babysit. (laughs) Yeah, it was it was a bit of both. And that was that was really cool. Like we got the cliche mechanic like, oh, man, that hose is mislabeled. That's going to cost you like 20 bucks. Uh huh. You know, it's it's the the the, uh, like I said, the cliche thing that we've you know, everybody's experienced that. And and I don't know, it's it's kind of tired, but in this instance with with her and the the freshness of of getting to deal like getting her to deal with the child or not deal with but you know getting her to be a parent at least a little bit or caretaker for a a moment like it it kind of not necessarily turned it on its head but mm-hmm. it it took it in a different direction that i was like oh they do have feelings sometimes yeah yeah that was it, it, it was a nice it was a nice touch and i also liked getting to see those the the bottle droids which I think until now we'd only seen in the Clone Wars uh, or in the um, prequels, I mean. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, because one of those got sucked through the engine of uh, Anakin. Right. In the pod race, didn't it? Yeah, and here, here they looked, I mean, obviously they were kind of cute and funny, but they also seemed less like comic relief and more like a kind of humorous but kind of real part of the world. Yeah, they looked like they were actually doing something rather than just being a, a gimmick, a mm-hmm. slapstick gimmick. Yeah, I mean they were still kind of slapstick gimmicky, but you know she was she was yelling at him to to get to work, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, sorry boss, sorry boss. Yeah, absolutely. So so what do we think of the main main meat of the story? You know the 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 young, the we haven't even gotten there yet. <laughs> yeah, the the young um uh you know wannabe um bounty hunter and the person they go on a bounty hunt with and and how all that plays out. You know, honestly, I like that there's more guild story going on. Mm-hmm. You know, there this this whole Mandalorian thing, like, you know good and well that the guild is huge and the guild is, you know, it probably deals with this kind of thing all the time. And this is just one other guy going rogue for a little bit that, you know, wants to get away from the guild that the guild has to take care of. And there's other guild business that, like the guild will go on outside of this. So yeah. it's great to to come into another facet of it and be like, oh yeah, the, the guild is just doing its thing. Cool. Yeah. But then there are people that know about him and, you know, it, it does come back to bite him, but still it's nice to have that kind of, um, you know, other look mm-hmm. at the, another part of it. And, and I liked that it was, um, it definitely played some with the, uh, the trope, you know, because, this idea of um, 
you know, the, the young idealistic, I just want to be, um, or not even idealistic, but you know, kind of stars in his eyes, you know, person working with the grizzled old bounty hunter. I mean, that, that's a very like understandable story. You know, it's a very relatable story it, or, or uh, it's also very much a Western cliche kind of a story. Um, yep. and that's, uh, it's something I'm trying to be more aware of as, um, uh, my co-host on the other side of this, um, Riki Hayashi, who co-hosts with me on the Clone Wars side of this podcast, uh, as he pointed out, the episode we talked about last time uh, was all 100% straight out of um, the Kurosawa Seven Samurai movie. Um, that that Western tale of the the guy who rides into town, finds out the townspeople are in need of help, decides to stay and help them, and all that. Um, so, yeah. I, with that in mind, I'm trying to be a lot more aware of kind of one of the Western cliches that are drawn upon. Um, and this one certainly does, but I like the twists that it does because going into this, I was fairly certain that, um, I'm going to try and get these names right, that, you know, that Shand was going to wind up killing Calican and the final showdown would be between, uh, you know, our hero and, uh, Fennec Shand. And oh, yeah. so to have a Calican kill her and actually let him become a little more of a threat was, I thought it was kind of a fun way to play with the trope and to give it a different direction. Yeah, it breathes a little bit of new life into it. And uh-huh. I feel like this series has done that a lot with uh, the some of the older tropes and older, not necessarily cliches, but the, the things that we've seen a little bit before, the stories that have been told. Like, it's it's not breaking new ground, but it is it is finding new ways to do the thing that has already been done, which, you know, is, in, is uh, interesting and intriguing in itself. You know, it's it's familiar, but it's a new take on it. Yeah. You know, it's again, it's that new facet on the, on the thing that we already know. Right. Yeah. It definitely provided a, a fun little twist. Um, as well as, um, I forget the actress's name, but Fennec Shand, um, she's, she's May uh, from agents of shield, right? I was like, that's Melinda May. Yeah. Melinda May she has no you. other name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's also starring in, Mul- she, she starred in both, I think the original and the new version of Mulan, if I believe right. So she, she, she might be known uh, for a couple other things as well. <laughs> She definitely starred in the original Mulan. I'm not sure if she's not Mulan in the new one, but I am right. not sure what role she has in it. I know she's spoken publicly, and maybe just be to give her blessing. I thought she, I thought she was playing still a, a, a small role because they wanted to like honor her in that way. But, but yeah, either way, she, she she's a very well known actress, and so I was very glad to see her in this. And I thought she was quite good, um, uh, even though it was just for kind of a small role. Yeah, I was man. I was really hoping that uh, that Ming Na Wen was going to do something more with um, with this this role, mm-hmm. or you know, show up for a while or like anything. Like, yeah, just I, I wanted more. And then she just died, kind of unceremoniously too. Like, it, if she got, I mean, did he uncuff her? I don't remember. Did he uncuff her before he shot her, or I, was that just it? I don't think so. I don't think so. And. um yeah, um, I, I was I was watching it on a laptop with a the sun kind of coming in over my shoulders, and so much of this episode is is shot in the dark, um, which I often don't mind. But I did, and granted, I was watching it under hard conditions. But I definitely, I remember this was true the last time I watched it. The way it was shot to really give that sense of at night, I thought made it hard to see some of the details. Yeah. Oh, the sun was going down, and she was holding her hands out to get uncuffed, and he didn't even take his eyes away from hers and shot her mm-hmm. in the guts. Ugh. And then she just died in the dirt. Man. Yeah. What a jerk. That really turned me against this little prick. <laughs> I mean, I think it's supposed to. Like you, At first, he's kind of like the lovable loser. And then by then, it's like, oh, nope. Okay, he's just a straight up bad guy for this episode. Yeah, yeah. He's this dopey idiot who we're just kind of like, okay, maybe he'll figure it out. You know, new guys, right? That's so funny. I've been around new guys at the job before. <laughs> and then he turns out to, oh man, he turns out to just be such a, such a jerk. Yeah. Kind of an ass. Ah. Um, and I guess that is one of the things about bottle episodes is a lot of times like you meet characters and you want to stay with them for a while longer, but they're just, they're just there for that one episode, you know? Um, yeah. I think it's a little bit more, uh, more selfish on my part because I like, uh, I like Mignon Wen just in general a lot yeah uh, especially as melinda may like i wanted to see her go on in something else because agents of shields coming to an end yeah uh, in this in the summer so like i wanted to do something else and 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 be part of the fandoms that i'm that i'm a fan or that i'm a part of like please come to my fandom <laughs> <laughs> that would have been totally awesome i i will say and i know there's a debate you and i've had uh in the past we have different sides on 
Um, and you've gotten me a lot of ways convinced that that sometimes binging is not the right way to watch things. Um, oh, yeah? I, I think, though, that this episode really reminds me of sometimes the, the problem with not binging because I, I think – when I first watched this show, I 100% binged it. I intentionally waited till it was almost done and then watched almost all of it at once. Um, I think I watched the first episode and then waited for the rest. Um, and I, I think, therefore, I didn't have this problem with this episode. But but doing it this way, when I'm rewatching one literally every week or in, in some extent every two weeks, I, I think it made me much more aware of the fact that this do, it, it just doesn't really – move the main story forward at all, you know? And I think I just, yeah. it made me much more, I think if I'd watched this week to week, I would have disliked this episode a lot more because I think I would have just been so frustrated with, well, like, that's all we get. You know, we don't know anything more <laughs> about Tatooine. We don't know anything more about the guild or the the child or, or any of that stuff. Yeah, like you didn't push my main story forward at all. Yeah. You took a break two weeks in a row to tell me some nothing extra story. Uh-huh. I mean... You could think about it like that, and I didn't whenever I was watching it week to week when it came out. Um, I just, I you know, I was enjoying it. I was just, you know, munching up my popcorn and enjoying what was being put in front of me mm-hmm. and kind of getting disappointed that Ming-Na Wen was not going to go on <laughs> in some sort of big role. But she wasn't that's, anymore, that's yeah. Not, that's personal beside the point. Yeah. Um, I mean, with this, it's it's just, you know, it's it's a, it had a chance to do something great. And it did do, it did give us a little bit, a teensy itty bitty, like little, a little tic tac nugget of some of the, the feelings on Tatooine about the empire, like about what, six minutes into the episode. Oh yeah. When he's on Tatooine and we see all the, the stormtrooper helmets on pikes mm-hmm. in, in the spaceport. And I'm like, Oh man, that's a nice, here moment. we go. Yeah. It was so it's, it's, it's visceral. It's brutal. It's, you know, it's it really sends a message, you know, which is the point. Well, but and it and it really it gives us a, this like being six minutes in, it's like, all right, here we go. Yeah. You know, we're going to get something good from this. And yeah, it, yeah, it was a different story. I, I think the one thing we get and maybe I'm headcanoning this and maybe I'm giving too, the writers too much credit, but I hope this is intentional is this this version of Tatooine seems like a sleepy backwater Instead of a like crime infused, you know, smuggler's den. Um, yeah. And I, and I do think like my hope is that that's not just because the writers just didn't want to write a whole big scene, but that that's somewhat the writers saying like, yeah, what, what made Tatooine the bustling, crazy place it was, was Jabba the Hutt. And with him gone, it, it, it just kind of fell away. It, and yeah. And, and maybe it's, it's a little less exciting, but it's also a little less dangerous because there isn't people in the bars ready to, you know you know, shoot you if they don't like you um, or the friend doesn't like you either. Um. (laughs) Do you think that this, uh, this might be the, the, uh, you know, in, okay, sorry. (sighs) Brain's going all over the place with this. So Matt Murdock, Daredevil, uh, Luke Cage, all of these, you know, New York street level heroes, they're always trying to take out the crime boss. But then when they take out the crime boss, there's a vacuum and then somebody fills that void and then they've got to take on that new guy. Right. Is this, is this, is Tatooine the place where you take out the crime boss and that's just it? Like, is this <laughs> the place that they're looking for? Yeah, it might be. I mean, it might be. Certainly it seems like, <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, that they, you take out Job of the Hut, and like, you know, maybe a month later you take out the Empire. And I mean, I don't know, maybe Tatooine is a little bit more part of the, it, on the one hand, the fact that, you know, th- these criminals and these bounty hunters can operate there tells me it's it's not a core world yet by any means. It's still out on the outer rim. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 it feels now more like a sleepy backwater than a than a criminal, uh, you know, a, a criminal underground. Um, it's like, oh, we can return to being a farm town. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that, you know, in two or three seasons, Tatooine will go back to being, you know, a crazy place again. But for, for now. Maybe. Um, it's just it's funny like this might it's kind of like when Jabba dies and the rest of the the crime bosses hear about it they're like ah who cares yeah (laughs) like nobody goes to take it over yeah exactly and it's just like all right well you know we'll move on with our lives as normal Mm -hmm. so and and now everybody can just kind of uh you know sleep a little easier it's it's nice to know that it's nice to know that places like that can exist 
Yeah, I, I definitely feel that. So I, I have something I want to say in a spoiler section, but other than that, um, I don't, I don't really think there's much more about this episode to go into, is there? Yeah, there's not really that much to talk about. I mean, it's, it was very self-contained. I mean, we might, there might be uh, a discussion that we could have about the Tuscan people because uh, hmm. they're not raiders, yeah. obviously. Uh, you know, we got to see what we've always known as like a really aggressive sand people uh, be bargained with. Yeah. And and just talked to in a in a regular way. And I, I thought that was interesting because I thought, A, that may well be a mark of, you know, what has happened with the changes. And maybe, you know, it was Jabba and the, the Empire who sort of drove the, the sand people into. Well, but, but but they were like that under the Old Republic, as we learned in um, Attack of the Clones. Um, so, so I'm not sure there, but, but the, the image I got actually is taking the old kind of Western motif, um, is a lot of times in stories like this, like, you know, oh, yeah. the plucky young gunfighter also knows nothing about the, the native populations and, right. and sees them as, you know, sort of scary and dangerous. And the guy who's been riding in the West for 30 years is like, yeah, you know, let, don't treat these people like badly. Just trade with them. They're just different. You know, there's nothing bad yeah. or, or wrong. And Just talk to them. And I got that kind of that, that idea from, from that there. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, way, that, the way that he was talking uh, about them, like, oh, we got to kill them. He's like, no, man, give me your, your binoculars mm-hmm. and we're good to go. And he's like, but I just bought these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I see the, uh, the, the similarity at this point now. Yeah. Like it didn't, it didn't click at first. Cause I was like, ah, Tuscan Raiders, you got, how are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You got to shoot them. Yeah. Like, you know, I had the same reaction and, and now I see the, the, the parallel there, you know, they're the, the native Americans where, you know, if you just talk to them, you can actually get something done. Yeah. That's very true. Ooh, so can man. we, uh, I think I mainly only have one question in the spoiler section, but can we move into the spoiler section? Absolutely. All right. So for anybody who has not seen the later episodes of the show, um, now is we're going to hit pause and talk about that some. Um, if you're going to if you want to drop out now, totally OK. Um, please th- thank you guys so much for being a part of this and uh, um, listen to this. Lots of great ways to stay in touch with us. All that will be in the show notes. Um, and we are going to uh, come back with a spoiler section right after this commercial message that we have no control over. All right. Going into a spoiler section now. Um, so that person who kneels by Shan's body at the end. It, yeah, the one that we don't know who it is. Is that paid off in any way in the later episodes that I'm not remembering? Uh, not that I know of. I, I went back to it and just, you know, like, uh, chopped through, clicked through the, uh, the timeline. And all we see is somebody standing over her. We don't see who it is, and we see a cape and boots and a hand as the the person kneels, Mm -hmm. and then it goes to credits. And I don't know who that is at all. Yeah. I mean, maybe... Maybe it's the moth who we meet towards the end, but I don't think so. That yeah, that's my thought. Is maybe it's the moth. I was trying to see if there was any sort of like indicator as as to like you know any anything about his uh, his ensemble, his his costume that gave it away. But no, nah, nothing that uh, is yeah immediately indicative of who it is. I I wonder if that's uh something that they left for later later seasons, or if that's just a plot hook that they just dropped completely randomly. Um. <laughs> We're like, yeah, this is a thing, and who cares? Yeah, yeah. I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, I would not say that they would do that, especially with this being directed by Dave Filoni. Yeah, like this particular episode. Yeah, I wonder if it's something that we're just missing, or if it's something that's going to be picked up on in later in later seasons. I, I'll definitely be curious about that because I, I do feel like there's such so much more to say. Yeah, I mean. Once it pays off, maybe. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, and if it's if it's just the moth, well, the moth survived, so it's still it's still possible that something could happen there. I mean, do you think that they would go so far as to uh, have him heal her in some way, or have him, you know, because it looks like she's dead, right? But I don't know that she necessarily got her vitals checked, or you know, if she can be brought back to life or whatever. I mean, maybe. And, and actually, I could see that being a thing that, that Filoni would do of, of sort of like 
I have no idea what we're going to do with this character, but we're going to leave ourselves a little bit of an out if we want to bring her back at some later point. Um, you know, Star Wars is for the most part not done much of the, you know, comic book style. You think they're dead, but actually here they come back. Um, with the yeah. one glaring exception of Darth Maul. Um, and even that's... A- what about Palpatine? Oh, God. I'm, I'm not... Yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, it tells you how much I don't even want to acknowledge the existence of that that I just Ugh. blocked it out of my memory um, hashtag not my Star Wars not my Star Wars not at all um yeah the uh... <laughs> you know the uh, my my coworker um the guy that I'm actually talking about starting another show with um he he posits this theory in that the eighth and ninth Star Wars movies are really like episodes eight and nine are really just sequels to uh, episode seven. They're both sequels to episode seven. You just have to choose which adventure you want to follow. Yeah, I I think that's a very good point. I think that's a um. There's many ways in which I feel like the final trilogy, more than anything else, has probably made John um John Favreau million. I'm sorry, or or Fe- Feige millions and millions of dollars because what it shows is how important a showrunner is because you know all those times then in the mcu um we we talked about like oh no this writer got fired off doctor strange or this director left this project like it's bad but part of why that kept happening was because those people wanted to do their own artistic vision and and the people who were running marvel studios were saying no like this is where doctor strange has to end up to set up the next movie and I, yep. I, I kind of like I watched Age of Ultron and I was like, oh, this is terrible. Let everyone be free. And then I watched the Star Wars movies where clearly like I don't think everyone is Ryan free. Johnson and J.J. Abrams have ever been in the same room, let alone talked about what their movies were doing. <laughs> and it made me be like, yep. Yeah. No. OK. That's that's why you need a, a really good head of the studio, you know, who's just keeping all the pieces in mind, because I, I feel like the. um that last trilogy really suffered for it. And I'm glad for shows like the Mandalorian, which at least seemed to be a lot more like, no, we're going to stick with established Canon and try to try to build a world that makes sense for it. Yeah. John Favreau and Dave Filoni working together with their, you know, they've got this unified vision of how the, the main story needs to go. And, and Dave Filoni has done such great work with the clone wars. Like it's, it's kind of a match made in heaven. And I think that we're, with with this series we're really getting to see where you know star wars can go with that that unified vision and kind of get back to the glory days so to speak yeah. because you know when when it was lucas before he got senile and made the prequels um when it was lucas it was all like holy crap this is the greatest thing ever and it's all and we ended on ah they did ah and like everybody's going nuts yeah you know we kind of get back to that where everything is just everything is so exciting again yeah no it's super true mm. and i am um, uh I, I know, like, the new MCU shows are supposed to be coming down the pike, and we'll see how much uh, production is delayed. I, I think I've asked you this before, but I just forget the answer. It, am I right that there is no on-the-docket, um, you know, Star Wars show that we know that's already being filmed and is supposed to come out fairly soon? Uh, as far as I know, there's not anything that is supposed to be coming out soon. Okay. Um, I think they they scrapped the Obi Wan Kenobi series because it was going to be too similar to the Mandalorian, right? Um, and they scrapped the. And... Um, there were a couple of planned movies that after Solo uh, bombed, thank God, it was terrible. Um, they <laughs> they also decided not to go that direction. So I'm and I'm again no complaints there, yeah. but I, yeah, I think because um, for a while it looked like we were going to get a Star Wars movie every year because we're getting the the new trilogy plus things like Rogue One and Solo. Um, and I think this year is where we're going to break that streak. <sighs> It's so disappointing, though, that Rogue One was so freaking good, and then Solo was so freaking bad, and yeah. they just kind of, because Solo blew up, they were like, ah, no, can't do any more, can't do any more. Well, I, like, no, man, give us new characters, they're doing new things, come on! I, I'm hoping that Mandalorian helps helps change that direction, because I, I think what made Rogue One so good and Solo so bad is that Rogue One was, like you said, it was new characters, and we knew vaguely how the story had to end in terms of like the plans had to escape and we knew probably these characters die because they're never heard of again but we didn't really know the exact details whereas like with solo it's like 
there's absolutely no tension. Okay, he meets this big Wookiee. We know they become friends, you know. He right. meets this, uh, you know, uh, pansexual gambler charm machine named Lando Calrissian. We know he's going to beat him in a gambling game and get the ship. Like, you know, and, and, I, and I would say, like, Lando Cal- if you gave me just a Lando Calrissian movie starring uh, uh, Daniel Glover, like, I'm in for that. He was the best part of that movie. But so much of Solo was trying to fill in gaps of stories we didn't want the gaps filled in on. And I, I think you're right. If we got more Rogue Ones or things like The Mandalorian that are telling stories in the universe but about characters we've never heard of, um, I'd be all for that. Yeah. You know what would have been really cool What's that? in in Solo is if that Wookiee in the pit in the mud had not been uh, Chewbacca. Oh, yeah. If that had been some other Wookiee that he had to fight. Uh-huh. Like, we, we would be thinking, oh, yeah, cool. This is where he meets Chewie. Like, I don't necessarily need to know where he meets Chewie. You know, it could be literally anywhere. Yeah. Like, all of this, all of this movie doesn't have to happen at the same time. Or, like, all of his backstory doesn't have to be all in this one week-long, yeah. you know, adventure in this movie. But if, if maybe this had been a different Wookiee that he you know, tricks into uh, pulling that, that pipe out and it collapses the floor, but it collapses on the Wookiee and kills it. And it's like, ah, yay, I, you know, outsmarted him and beat him myself, yeah. kind of. And then also got myself to escape. And maybe, like, if he had kept something that that Wookiee had or, you know, uh, used the a belt that it was wearing or something to get himself out and, like, kept the belt with him. And then the other Wookiees that he met recognized that belt, like, hey, that was my friend. Yeah. He was a great warrior. You beat him. You know, respect. Maybe something like that. Like, anything could have happened other than just, like, oh, they're friends. Yeah, I, I would have loved a misdirect like that. Like, um, have you seen the J.J. Abrams? Um, J.J. Abrams made a movie set in space aboard a starship that had warp nacelles. Um. I'm talking about Star Trek, but trying not to call it that because it was so not Star Trek. But but do you know the movie I'm talking about? (laughs) Yeah. So one of the things I liked about that movie, even though it's 100% not a Star Trek movie, um, Mm -hmm. but is the fact that um, early on, you know, you meet who's Captain Kirk and he clearly meets the person who's becoming Bones and they, they meet Spock and then they meet someone who loves engineering and has a thick Scottish accent and you're like, oh, okay, this is going to be Scotty. Um, and then, like, ten minutes in, that person dies when they try to, like, land on a mining thing. Um, and I just thought it was such a brilliant little <laughs> twist of, like, give us a character who you think is going to be Scotty. And, like, nope, not that person. Uh, your fault for assuming. Right, so. right out from under you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, not every Scottish person is the same. You know, right. there's multiple Scottish people in the universe. Jerk. Well, and it tells you something when I'm saying... I really wish that Solo had had the wisdom and uh, depth of the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie. I mean, that That's that is really a sad. low bar to set. Um, <laughs> so, um, yep, yep. And, you know, and here would be actually a fun thing. So, you know, you're you're obviously with this on with me on this one. Uh, your buddy Matt Carroll, my buddy, who you do the MCU cast with, him and Dave Robinson are obviously very involved in the Star Trek podcast. I want to get all of us together for a simple to do an episode on one topic. Which one of our fandoms did J.J. Abrams screw up more? Star Wars or Star Trek? Um, It's a hard one, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could even say that J.J. Abrams screwed up his own fandom. Yeah. uh, In Lost. Oh, yeah. That's also very true. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, All right. So I, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Anything else you got? That's fair. Uh. Not as far as, like, broad spoilers, yeah. no? Or uh, well, broad universe discussion. Yeah. Any other last thoughts on the episode? I think we can just kind of wrap up now. Yeah, we're we're good to go, man. Cool. All right. Well, um, uh, Toy fans, thank you guys so much. Um, Jeff, you and I are now both doing a bunch of different podcasts on the uh, uh, Stranded Panda Podcast Network. Um, and we're not going to go over all of them that we've done a couple times. I think our, our fans have heard that. But let me just ask you, like, what's one cool thing you've done on one of the other podcasts recently that people should check out? Uh, one cool thing that we have done is talked about Logan on Oof. the Avengers Assemble. Talk about a kid friendly um, movie. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we actually got to no, no, no. This is the this is the crazy thing is we got to talk about an X Men movie that was good Ooh. and actually made me weep. Yeah, that's crazy. That never happens. I, I'm excited to listen to that episode. I, I think actually I, I sent in a question that I think you guys discussed a little bit in terms of uh, we, um, we did where Professor X winds up. 
Logan is, I know it's not officially part of the MCU. It is far and away my favorite, I think my favorite MCU movie, Marvel movie ever made. Possibly my favorite comic book movie ever made with the possible exception of The Dark Knight. Um, Because it is just so good and so rich and gets into all the kind of questions that I love so much. Um, Yep. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on there. Um, Yeah, and there's so many emotions to be had. Yeah all over the place i mean there's oof, yeah there there's so much ethical just it's a gold mine it's a gold mine of discussion and so that's on the bingers assemble podcast yes cool yeah that's on bingers well i guess we're gonna do a double hit on that because um the podcast i would mention is also on the bingers assemble um matt carol and i have been doing a uh, watch of altered carbon um oh, talk about a kid friendly yeah, show jesus um <laughs> very intense and by the time that um you all are listening to this we'll probably be into like maybe season two but basically because matt and i are both at home and uh quarantined every day at 11 o'clock central we are watching the show together on a netflix party um and all um if you're a patreon of uh superhero ethics or any of the other stranded panda shows you're welcome to jump in with that and then around noon um we're hopping on the um mcu cast twitch tv uh, and doing a, a live podcast where we're, uh, you guys can listen live and take feedback and we'll take your feedback and questions. And that's that the, the live part there is open to anybody, not just Patreon. So, uh, information to that links to all the stuff we've talked about will be in the show notes. Please check that out. As always, we'd love to hear from you, hear your thoughts. Um, is there stuff in this episode we're missing? Was there like some great details that Jeff and I kind of glossed over that you think are really worth discussing? Let us know. You can find us on, um, email, uh, at superhero uh, yeah, Star Wars Universe Podcast at gmail.com. We're also on uh, Facebook and Twitter at the Star Wars Universe Podcast. Um, and all that's in the show notes. So, Jeff, thanks as always for being a part of this. Uh, to all our fans, thank you all for listening. Have a great day. I have spoken. <laughs>